air traffic professionals, operators, airports, and other aviation stakeholders design a procedure that will then pass through quality control checks to verify compatibility with aircraft navigation and flight control systems prior to the flight. With quality checks and training complete, the procedure is flown to verify the accuracy of the design and identify possible modifications. Once the new procedures are implemented, FAA safety teams monitor for any issues, then old procedures are completely replaced. This video provides a basic understanding of how the air traffic control system works in the Florida airspace and how and why the FAA is modernizing the national airspace system. Welcome to the FAA's virtual public workshop on the draft environmental assessment for the South Central Florida Metroplex. I'm Michael O'Hara, Regional Administrator for the FAA Southern Region. Florida is the only state in the country with four major international airports, Miami, Fort Lauderdale Hollywood, Orlando, and Tampa. Palm Beach and St. Pete Clearwater International are also important airports in the national airspace system. In addition, Florida has a significant number of general aviation airports. You get the picture. Florida is one of the busiest states for aviation in the United States. The South Central Florida Metroplex is the FAA's plan to modernize air traffic procedures for 21 airports in the southern half of Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology. While safe, these procedures are less precise and efficient than those based on satellite technology. The satellite-based routes proposed for the Metroplex project will enhance safety and efficiency across the region. Metroplex will benefit passengers by creating more direct routes, decrease congestion at airports and in the air, improve air traffic flows, enhancing safety and efficiency, and reduce complexity and communication for air traffic controllers and pilots, making the system safer. Before we can change procedures, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, requires us to conduct an environmental assessment to determine the potential impacts of the proposed procedures. One purpose of NEPA is to ensure that proposals, alternatives, and environmental impacts of projects are fully disclosed to the public. That's why we're here today. On May 11th, the FAA posted the Draft Environmental Assessment, or EA, for the Metroplex, and we opened a 60-day public comment period that closes on July 10th. We hope that you will consider submitting comments about the document. On this website, you can click the Comments tab, and it will show you how to submit your comments. It provides email addresses and a physical address where you can send comments after the workshop. Be sure to get your comments in before the July 10th deadline. After the comment period closes, we will review and consider all substantive comments received during the comment period as we develop the environmental determination. We expect to issue the determination by September 30th, 2020. A note about the draft EA. The FAA identified inadvertent errors related to runway designations for Orlando, Tampa, and St. Pete Clearwater International Airports. We updated the document on May 13th, and it's posted at metroplexenvironmental.com. I'd like to cover three procedural items before we start. First, 
If you're having technical issues, you can text us anytime during the workshop at 949-478-0253 or click the technical support tab on this web page. Second, the workshop will last 90 minutes. We are recording the workshop and it will be posted on this website tomorrow for you to review. You can share the link with friends and neighbors who are unable to participate today. And finally, we have experts available to answer questions about the draft EA and the proposed air traffic control procedures. FAA air traffic controllers, environmental specialists, and industry representatives will answer your questions after the presentation. As a reminder, the questions asked and answers provided here are not part of the official record for the draft EA. To comment for the official record, click on the comments tab on this website. That will link you to the FAA's official comment page for this project. Now, Lisa Favors, an environmental specialist for the FAA's air traffic organization will brief us on the draft environmental assessment. Thank you, Michael. I will explain the draft EA for the South Central Florida Metroplex. As mentioned earlier, we developed the document in accordance with NEPA, which requires us first to identify the purpose and need for the project. In this case, the purpose and need addresses the current inefficient arrival and departure procedures for airports in South Central Florida. Many of the existing procedures are based on outdated technology and are less precise and efficient than satellite procedures. We need to fix that. The draft EA identifies causes for inefficiency as lack of predictable routes or procedures to transition aircraft between airport runways and high altitude in route airspace complex interactions between converging routes and lack of flexibility for air traffic controllers as they transition flights between high altitude and low altitude airspace. By adopting new procedures, which the draft EA calls the proposed action, we expect reduced workload due to fewer controller pilot communications more efficient operations due to decreased complexity and fewer flight segments resulting in more predictable traffic flows. A detailed explanation of the purpose and need is included in Chapter 2 of the Draft EA. The Draft EA analyzes potential environmental impacts from the proposed action and the no action alternative. It is important to note that we analyze many additional procedures, but they not carried forward for detailed study in the draft EA because they did not meet the purpose and need or applicable safety standards. Under no action, procedures in place from June 2017 to May 2018 would remain except for planned modifications that are independent of the Metroplex. Our analysis determined that only the proposed action would meet the purpose and need for the project. The no action alternative would not meet the purpose and need, but it was included in the draft EA as required by Council on Environmental Quality Regulations. The alternatives are described in chapter three of the draft EA. Affected environment describes the human physical, and natural environmental conditions that the proposed action could affect. The affected environment is described in detail in Chapter 4 of the Draft EA. The Draft EA considers the effects on 14 environmental resource categories and their subcategories identified in FAA guidance. We evaluated the alternatives under conditions forecasted for 2021, the first year the proposed action could be implemented, 
and under the 2026 forecasted conditions. The evaluation considers the direct, indirect, and cumulative effects of the proposed action and no action alternatives. The draft EA determined that neither the proposed action nor the no action alternatives are likely to cause significant environmental impacts to any of the environmental resource categories. For more information, you can review chapter five in the draft EA. The rest of my discussion will focus on the noise analysis since you, the public, express most interest in that. However, feel free to ask questions about any category during the Q&A session later in the workshop. First, I will explain how we measure noise. The FAA measures aviation noise using the day-night average sound level, DNL, metric. DNL represents noise as it occurs over a 24-hour period, with nighttime noise weighted more heavily than daytime noise. DNL is the standard noise metric used for studies of aviation noise exposure in communities. To account for differences in how people respond to noise, we use the A-weighted scale, DBA. This scale closely approximates the volume of sound as perceived by the human ear. The FAA considers aircraft noise exposure of 65 DNL in residential areas and noise increases of DNL 1.5 dB or more for noise sensitive areas exposed to noise at or above the DNL 65 dB noise exposure level to be significant. The noise analysis demonstrates that the proposed action would not result in significant noise increases. More information about how the FAA measures noise is in Appendix E of the draft EA, and a detailed noise analysis can be found in Appendix I. Before I end, the following video will show you how to look up noise information for your address. You may search more than 122,000 grid points of noise data in the study area, presented in decibels, abbreviated as DB. The grid points are U.S. Census population points located at one half nautical mile intervals across the entire study area. The map opens to the study area. In the search bar, start typing your address and similar addresses will pop up. Click on the correct address and you will see a light blue map pin. The map shows the model grid points in blue. Click on each point to see a pop-up with noise analysis results. The map shows data including DNL calculated for the alternatives and the change in noise when the proposed action is compared to the no action alternative. Now our air traffic control expert will brief you on some of the more significant procedures the Metroplex proposes for your area. Hello, my name is Jeff and I'm an air traffic controller at Tampa International. We will walk you through a few of the flight procedure poster boards for Tampa International and St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. Each of the following boards shows a sampling of existing flight tracks and proposed new flight procedures for jet traffic. Each board will show either arrival or departure aircraft with current day tracks color coded via altitude. The flight tracks and proposed procedures are all overlaid on a map of the surrounding area. Each flight procedure board is oriented with north facing up. The name of the airport and the names of the flight procedures are in the box in the upper right hand corner. This box also shows the type of operation, either arrival or departure, and the direction of flight, which we will call flow, either north, south, east, or west. Flow is related to the layout of the airport's runways. For example, north flow runways include runway one left and one right. 
These runways allow aircraft to land and depart northbound. Runways 19 or left and runway 19 or right are used in a south flow operation and allows aircraft to land and depart southbound over Tampa Bay. A few acronyms are used in the boards. A standard instrument departure, or SID, is a departure. A standard terminal arrival, or STAR, is an arrival. Area navigation, or RNAV, is the term for modern satellite-based navigation technology used in the proposed procedures. The spelling of each arrival or departure procedure is limited to five letters. For example, the spelling of BLFRG is pronounced bullfrog. The stars on the board are locations of waypoints, which are fixed navigation points in space that the aircraft fly to. Just as with the spelling of procedures, waypoints are spelled with five letters. For example, the JSTRM waypoint would be pronounced JetStream. The proposed flight procedures are colored purple for departures and orange for arrivals. These colored paths show the intended flight paths in the future for most flights using the new procedures. Surrounding the paths are dispersed path areas in either pink for departures or yellow for arrivals. These areas show the possible locations where aircraft may fly in the future and account for the possibility of different routing to avoid hazardous weather for operational need or for safety. The existing flight tracks are shown on the legend by color, starting from lowest altitudes in pink, then blue, then teal, and finally the highest altitudes are in green. Here are examples of arrival flight tracks landing at Tampa International Airport to the north. Notice the colors changing and their respective altitudes associated with the colors. The flight tracks shown are a sample of jet aircraft operations which occurred in March of 2018 for Tampa and January to May of 2018 for St. Pete during daytime, which does not include nighttime hours between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. The bullet points on the right provide additional details about the procedures. My name is Chuck and I'm an air traffic controller at the Tampa International Airport. Next, we'll look at each arrival and departure boards for these airports. This flight procedure board is for the Tampa International Airport North Flow Arrivals, which means airplanes are arriving over Tampa Bay and taken off to the north over land. There are four proposed arrival procedures, the Bullfrog, Dates, Matey, and Rays. Where only one left is used for the majority of operations for North Flow, although runway one right is also used. North Flow is the more common direction of traffic flow. Aircraft arriving from the west use a raise and media arrival procedures. Aircraft from the north and the east use a dades arrival, and aircraft from the south use a bullfrog arrival procedure. Aircraft arriving to the Tampa area will fly to a navigational waypoint. After that, an air traffic controller will issue a pilot a heading called a vector, and that will guide them to the airport to land. For example, on the dades arrival procedure, aircraft will fly to either Guzda ports, jet stream waypoint, and are given headings to the airport. For all procedures, air traffic controllers may direct aircraft away from the procedure to avoid hazardous weather, for operational need, or for safety. The next board is for south flow arrivals, which means airplanes are arriving overland and taking off to the south over Tampa Bay. There are four proposed arrival procedures, Bullfrog, Dades, Matey, and Rays. As you can see, the proposed procedure mimic current day flight track airplanes fly today. South flow is a less common direction of flow. Runway 19 left, runway 19 right are used equally for south flow operation. Aircraft arriving from the west use the raise and media arrival procedures. Aircraft to the north and east use the days arrival procedures. And aircraft from the south use the bulldog arrival procedure. As with north flow arrivals, aircraft from the south flow arriving to the Tampa area will fly to a navigational waypoint on each procedure. After that, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading to follow called a vector that will guide them to the land at the airport. The next board is for north flow departures, which 
Aircraft take off to the north of our land. There are five proposed departure procedures, the Gandhi, Bapo, Nost, Ended, and Crowd. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations would use the Bapo departure. Aircraft with destinations to the northwest would use the Ended departure. Southerly destinations use the Gandhi departure. Southeast departures use the Crowd, and the westbound departures use the Nost departure. Aircraft depart and after departure, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading called a vector that will guide them out of the Tampa area to join one of the departure procedures. For example, aircraft on the Bapa departure will be given a navigational heading to Finky Waypoint. Aircraft will fly a similar path as they do today to get to these procedures. The next board is for South Flow Departures, which is aircraft departing to the south over Tampa Bay using one of the five proposed departure procedures, the Bapo, Sykes, Ended, Gandhi, and Crowd. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations will use the Bapo and Ended departures. Aircraft with destinations to the southwest use the Sykes departure. East and southeast destinations use the Gandhi and Crowd departures. When an aircraft departs, an air traffic controller will give a pilot a heading to follow to join one of the five departure procedures based on their destination. This next board shows all proposed Tampa International Airport North Flow procedures, including the five departure procedures and five arrival procedures. As we've shown, North Flow is the most common direction of traffic flow at Tampa. For North Flow procedures, departures shown in purple are given a navigational heading to follow to join the departure procedures. Aircraft arriving to the Tampa area on routes shown in orange will fly in the proposed procedure until an air traffic controller issues a heading to guide the pilot to land. This next board is for operations at the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport in a north flow, which like Tampa is the most common direction of traffic. There are three proposed departure procedures, the Baypo, Ended, and Sykes. As you can see, the proposed procedures mimic current day flight tracks airplanes fly today. Generally, aircraft with northern destinations will use the Baypo departure, Aircraft with destinations to the northwest use the ended departure, and southerly destinations use the Sykes departure. In a north flow, aircraft used runway 36 for the majority of operations and occasionally used runway 4. Welcome to the, the Q&A workshop session this morning, this evening. Uh, I'm Michael O'Hara. I'm joined by several uh, technical experts, including Jeff, Chuck, and Chris, air traffic controllers from the Tampa International Airport Control Tower and the Radar Approach Control. We also have Lisa Favors, an FAA environmental specialist, and we have from our FAA headquarters, Jim Riggi, Laura Zabriski, Beth White, and from our Florida Metroplex co-leads, Christian Carnes and Vicki Turner. We have Annabelle with us to help with any Spanish translation, and we're also joined by industry representatives from the airlines, from the Airline Pilots Association, as well as the Tampa International Airport and the St. Pete Clearwater International Airport. So welcome, everyone. We're holding this workshop to answer questions that you may have about the South Central Florida Metroplex project. We're unable to answer questions about other topics in this workshop. We wanna keep the focus on the Metroplex, but you can submit questions to us this evening through the, uh, the Q&A or the, the chat box on Zoom, Facebook, and YouTube, or you can text your question to us at 949-478-0253. 
Again, that's 949-478-0253. If you need any technical assistance, please click on the technical support tab on our website. And thanks again for joining us. And we will start with our first question. For first question we have is, Will any of these new changes affect airplanes, letting them fly lower with more noise over homes and communities near Sarasota, specifically near Moat Ranch or and uh, the Palm Air areas? So, Chris, I'd like to ask if you could help with that question. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, no, no procedures during Metroplex are affecting any of the uh, Sarasota arrivals or departures at this time. Okay, thanks, Chris. And the next question we have is, how many changes will we see at Tampa? Will Metroplex make any change to existing noise abatement procedures at Tampa or increase the number of flights? So I'll, again, I'll ask if our air traffic Folks, Chuck, do you want to help with that? I'll take that, yeah. Uh, as far as the uh, number of flights, uh, that's an industry question. Uh, the uh, The only departure, uh, the only changes is one of the departures on the uh, north operation, uh, north flow. Uh, the nose departure is the only uh, change on our departures. Um, today, we don't turn airplanes until they get above 3,000 feet. It'll be the same thing with the, uh, the new departures, the NOST. And so that'll be the only change we have. Okay, thanks, Chuck. And it, in terms of the project specifically, it's not intended to increase the number of flights. So I, I can answer that question as well. All right, so the next question. Did the airport ask you to do this project? Um, so I'll start out by saying, no, we, uh, this is a federal FAA project. It's a federal action. There are a lot of stakeholders that we reach out to, to help with a project like this. And there are many, many stakeholders that need to be involved in a project that's complex, like the South Central Florida Metroplex. But again, this is the FAA's project. We're responsible for the safe and efficient movement of aircraft through the national airspace system. And we certainly appreciate the collaboration with our industry partners in the development of the proposed changes. And, and I believe that they'll be valuable for the system and the users. This is an FAA project. Specifically, we work with, with industry because they operate the aircraft. They have equipment that utilize new procedures when we make changes. And the airports are often familiar with the community that surrounds the airport and some of the noise sensitive areas. And they, they ensure that the FAA is aware of information like that as we work through the project. But again, it's an FAA project. But thanks for that question. We'll continue through. The next question I have, I heard that older airplanes like MD-80s are not flying at Sarasota anymore. Will that reduce the noise. Uh, Lisa, I may ask if you have any input on that and we'll see if anybody in the industry wants to share as well. Okay. Um, well, you know, um, the FAA is really committed to reducing aircraft noise um, through a balanced approach, um, through the reduction of the noise at the source. And that source is the aircraft, the engine. You know, and um, we are also committed to improving land use planning around airports and um, a wider use of aircraft operating procedures, operation procedures, and um, reduction of abatement, no noise abatement procedures, and um, future noise reductions will depend largely on advances being developed through the next gen. Um, next gen air transportation um, systems. And that's what we call next gen. It's called next generation air transportation systems. Um, and, you know, that system, it increases the percentage 
percentages of air that goes through an engine and not through the combustor, uh, the combustor and the aircraft noise levels have dropped about 20 decibels or more. Um, that translates into making one fourth of, of as much noise as it did maybe 50 years ago. So, you know, with all of those efforts that have been done, um, you know, the aircraft are more quieter and more efficient. But if anyone from the industry has anything to add to that, we're welcome, welcome to jump in there. Lisa, we'll jump in and help you. The, the aircraft manufacturers are doing a great job of building new airplanes and engine technologies that are substantially quieter than they have been for many years. The airlines are also buying those airplanes and they're putting them into use and there's very few MD-80s flying in, in the system today. So it, it's a joint effort between the aircraft manufacturers building airplanes that are more efficient, less noisy, and the airlines are buying those airplanes and putting them to use uh, as fast as we possibly can. All right, thanks Thank Gary. You, Gary. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa, as well. All right, we'll continue. I'll move to another question. How will the Metroplex, how will this project help Florida? If you, if you look at the, the big picture of, for the project, this project affects the routes in and out of 21 airports in Florida, what we call the study area, and it covers 106 new, more efficient satellite-based and conventional air traffic control procedures. That'll help improve the safety and efficiency of the system throughout Florida, but also help connect Florida to other parts of the country. The Metroplex will help us make the best use of the airspace of procedures based on the precision associated with satellite technology. So at a, at a high level, it'll benefit passengers by creating more direct routes, helping to reduce flight delays, the project helps decrease congestion at airports and in the air. If you think about the close proximity between many of the airports in Florida, uh, decon decongesting those routes is very helpful to the efficiency. It helps us improve air traffic flows, enhancing safety and efficiency. And we also modernize air traffic procedures to today's standards. In addition, the precise predictable routes reduce the complexity and the communication that's required between air traffic controllers and the pilots. And that helps make the system safer as they have fewer distractions and fewer communications required. It's a quick high level overview. We'll continue to move through the questions. If, if any of the panelists wanted to add anything, Jim, you popped up. Did you have anything to add? Well, I, I did. And, uh, you know, you gave a really good summary of, you know, what types of benefits that these accurate and repeatable paths will bring uh, to, to the local area. But, you know, in, in that larger sense, you know, outside of Florida, this is part of an effort to modernize the entire, the entire national airspace system to these two types of procedures. So we've got a number of other initiatives um, underneath that next gen mantra. We've got uh, a data comm for the automatic transmission of uh, clearances to, to the uh, flight deck from air traffic control and response back. Uh, we've got the uh, FAA air traffic system computers, you know, constantly being upgraded and being modernized so that they can operate with this digital environment. So the types of procedures that we've developed allow us to, you know, predict where aircraft will be. So we we are moving from a um, a system where, you know, when we see the aircraft, then we make a we give it a clearance and we determine what we're going to do with them to one where we're able to project the trajectory of an aircraft throughout the entire national airspace system. Uh, often, you know, before they even leave the gate for, for takeoff. So, uh, you know, the, the types of procedures that we're implementing, uh, you know, lend themselves to that because they are, are very accurate, repeatable, and predictable paths. 
No, great, Jim. Great, great point. It brings to mind the, the, some of the statistics we talk about. Florida is the only state in the country that has four major international airports, and it also has the second highest uh, number of passengers that move through the state. Uh, aviation has an economic benefit to the state of Florida of $175 billion. So the efficient movement of aircraft within the state and connecting to other parts of the country is critical. And as Jim mentioned, that overall picture, uh, thinking of Florida infrastructure as well as the connectivity more broadly is, is great. Thanks, Jim, for the clarification. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving through questions. I have another one here. I live by the Manette Golf Course. Uh, is the FAA changing the procedures near my house? And can you show the noise tool? So we may be able to pull that up in the noise tool. Lisa, I may ask if you can pull that up and maybe if, if we want to tag team with air traffic, they may be able to provide some information on, on where specifically we're talking about. Sure, um, I can give you a, a brief uh, little run through of the noise tool. Um, if you go to um, the same website that you were, you just came back through, that's Florida Metroplex workshop.com um, and once you're at that website um, in this middle um, area near the top you'll see a button that uh, says noise tool click that button it'll bring you to this page and you know um, on this page you can search more than um, 122,000 grid points of, of noise data in it, across the entire study area but specifically, if you want to um, search for an address, we can try a sample address so I can show you. You click in that search bar at the top left-hand corner of the um, map. And once you do that, you can start typing an address and um, similar addresses will be populated down below and you can just click on your precise address you're concerned about and um, the, it'll bring you to that uh, and I'll give you a little light blue map pen at that address. And then you just need to locate one of the um, the modeled, uh, the map shows model grid points in blue, the little blue circle. And you can search those, you can click on that uh, point and it will give you some, some it'll show you the data. Um, it includes uh, DNL calculated for the, for the alternative and the change in noise when the proposed action is compared to the no action alternative. So you can search around your residence or whatever address you are concerned about. Um, and if someone from air traffic can speak specifically to um, that, that area, the uh, Manette Golf Course. Yeah, Lisa, this is Chuck, in. thank you. Uh, the uh, Manette Golf Course, I believe, is just north of uh, Sarasota. There are no changes to that area that would affect that golf course. So the answer to that question is no. All right. Thanks, Chuck. And thanks, Lisa. Okay. We'll keep, keep moving through questions. If... Um, if a resident observes an increase in the concentration of aircraft overflights from these procedures, who should I contact at the FAA? All right. Uh, so a couple things. I, I may I may ask for your help on that, Lisa. But one thing I want to say is, in terms of the timing of new procedures, uh, we would not be implementing any changes with this project until the spring or summer of 2021. I want to just take the opportunity to share the time frame that we're looking at with procedures. And then, Lisa, do you have information on specific contacts if they want to reach us at the FAA on noise? Uh, the, yes, um, Michael, the best way that they can contact us um, for noise complaints, you can always go to FAA.gov. And once you're there, you can, um, you can uh, search for, uh, we have a new noise portal. Um, once you get to FAA.gov, it's important to, to search in the Southern region. And once you reach the Southern region, you can find a link there to a noise portal. And that noise portal will can certainly um, uh, tell you more about noise. 
Um, that website can give you more information about noise. It might even answer your concern, but mm -hmm. certainly you can leave a comment there as well. And I also, yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lisa. I'm going to keep us moving to the next question. I hear the word procedure used. What is a procedure? So I'm, I may take a stab at that. We'll see if air traffic wants to add to it. But we're moving from ground-based to satellite-based routes that give us the ability to match technology that's now available for the newer aircraft. So it's, it's much like many modes of transportation that get modernized. But a procedure is a precise, predictable path that the aircraft will fly. And you think about it going from point A to point B, or I'm going from the airport to this point in the sky, and there's a very defined path that will define um, you know, the path that the aircraft will fly. Everything from the altitude to the speed in some cases, and again, very predictable, repeatable, defined path. So when an air traffic controller puts an aircraft on a procedure, both the pilot and the controller, and if, if equipped, the aircraft knows that the aircraft will be safely separated from other aircraft uh, flying other procedures in the airspace. So from an air traffic control perspective, any, anything to add to that? Yeah, Michael, I'll take this. Uh, when we put those airplanes on those procedures, it just uh, it, it gives us confidence that they're going to be separated from the other aircraft that are on other procedures. And uh, when they're done properly, it works perfect. So, so that's a very safe thing and, and that's what we like to do. Okay, Jeff, thanks. We may have covered that, but, but today some procedures are vectoring, maybe giving an aircraft a turn to a in a direction, climb to an altitude, make another turn, maybe climb to another altitude. This is essentially fly this route and all of that information would be defined if that helps provide picture for folks who may not be familiar. Hey, Michael, could we uh, maybe ask one of our uh, our pilots, either uh, Gary or Dan, to give us some insight into um, the benefits of these procedures for the uh, flight deck? We, we'd be happy to help, Jim. That, that's a, a great idea. What, what a procedure is to us is something that air traffic assigns to us. They, they call us on the radio. They tell us what procedure. It could be a departure and arrival. And we programmed that into our flight management computer. And the air, airplane at that time helps us you know, learn and follow where the controller has assigned us to fly. It's three-dimensional. It tells us like a highway, the, the lateral path that we'll fly. But the computer also gives us a vertical path to fly. And most of the time on these new procedures, we spend a lot of time at idle and trying to get the airplane down in, in an arrival. The, the third piece of that is it does give us the ability to let the airplane fly a speed. All of those components help us help the controller separate the traffic and make it safer to fly in all this airspace. All right, very good. Gary, thanks. Okay. So here's, a, here's another question. The draft environmental assessment shows flight track diagrams with vectoring and some diagrams without vectoring. There's a note on those and maybe we could pull a couple of those up. But I'll ask if anybody in air traffic control maybe could speak to some of those notes that are on the boards and when we use vectoring and when we're talking about the more specific precise procedures. Or... Um, sure, I, I can take that, I guess. So initially, you know, the aircraft come out, we uh, send them on a vector, uh, which is just the heading uh, on the compass. And if you kind of think in the, the wheels or the old um, hub and spoke system or the spoke of a, a wheel, we send the departures out one and bring the arrivals in the other. And basically we initially vector to those points and then they join the procedure the rest of the way out. Okay, I think it might help if we pulled up one of the one of the boards for 
uh, for the Tampa area. And I guess what I'm thinking is there's some places that the routes are more precise and then there are places that air traffic will maybe turn an aircraft off that precise route to line up with the final approach. And I don't know if that would provide a, a clear example. I, I may be missing the question myself specifically, but in the diagram that's up, for example, you can see the, the more precise route coming down from, for example, the uh, Mady from the Northwest. And then as aircraft travel along just to the west of Tampa Airport, they spread out the same way that they do today and then turn on to final. And that could be, that would be vectoring by air traffic control. It would also depend on other aircraft that were in the flight pattern. So I'm not sure if that gets at the specific question, but some of the procedure might be precise and some of it might be vectoring as today. Michael, this is Chuck. I'll uh, take a stab at that. Uh, we, uh, we, we have the procedures we spoke about earlier. Uh, aircraft to go from point to point to point on a uh, waypoint. And uh, the, the flight management system inside the cockpit will send that aircraft to that point unless we get what we called earlier a vector. Uh, then we'll, we'll vector those aircraft depending on the, uh, a lot of different things, uh, conflicts with other aircraft, sequencing with other aircraft, maybe some weather or other issues that we may have to vector aircraft around. So the, uh, the lines you see is the general um, routes the aircraft come in on, and you can see some turn to the final further south than the other ones. Uh, and the reason why that is, is we want to turn somebody inside of another aircraft on, on the other side, or we may want to vector them farther south and let the guy on the other side come in earlier. So that's what, uh, it's kind of a dynamic process. It's not one fits all, all the time. Okay, if we could leave that diagram up uh, to, for just a moment. Uh, the next question actually is, why do you have to do new flight paths? I just wanna take advantage of the graphic being up. This project is more about implementing satellite-based procedures that have the precision that we've been talking about, but it's not necessarily new areas for planes to fly. And that's pretty well depicted on a chart like this. So we're defining new satellite-based routes that are precise and give us the predictability that Jim shared and that you've heard air traffic control and industry talk about. But if you look at where planes will fly on the future, whether that's obvious on this picture or not, it, it, um, they'll be flying essentially in the same place that they're flying today. All right, we'll continue through questions. Does the FAA uh, does the FAA look at or and or research the health concerns from overhead aircraft noise and fuel emissions? Uh, if so, could you make your research and or information available? Okay. So that Lisa, is that something that you want to take? I will try to take that, um, Michael. Um, the FAA's Office of Environment and Energy. Um, is actively engaged in researching aircraft noise and air emissions. Um, we partner with organizations from academia like uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology and other federal agencies like NASA. Um, uh, you are welcome to visit the FAA's website uh, for additional information regarding the ongoing research um, and related noise and emission information. Um, what we can tell you is that aircraft are generally becoming quieter and have reduced emissions from historic levels. So um, that can help. And if you also go to um, fa.gov, once you get there, you can type in, because uh, our website can be a little, a little um, busy, but once you get to FAA.gov, you can search for Office of Environment and Energy, and that will put you in the correct place. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And I know that we're pulling up some of the boards and materials during the workshop. I wanted to share that uh, in the area I refer to kind of as the lobby area that you visit when you come into the workshop, you can go back and visit those. We're actually recording the session tonight, so you'll be able to play back our, our
our session this evening or share it with friends and family. You can also go back and pull up those boards. That, some of them have notes, they're narrated versions of those, but if you click on them, you can view those full screen and uh, spend, spend some time if you wanna see those after the workshop. So, again, thanks Lisa for helping out with that. Okay, we'll continue. Regarding the Lakeland Linder International Airport, will these changes allow departures from the airport to receive higher initial climbing altitudes, especially with Amazon Air uh, starting operations in July? This would help reduce potential noise issues over the city of Lakeland. Currently, most departures are given climbing instructions to just 2,000 or 2,500 feet initially. We can probably pull up some displays on that. And uh, Chris, it looks like you're ready to go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so um, there's no procedures with Metroplex that actually involve some of this, but it is a good question. And it, it would be something that gets worked out uh, with coordination between us and Lakeland Tower controllers, as far as which runway, whether it's, they're coming off the east or west runways. Um, and that we can uh, coordinate or allow for a higher altitude initially. Okay, Chris, thanks. Okay, uh, next question. I understand that noise impacts aren't considered significant, but there will indeed be impacts. Uh, were visual impacts considered for the increased concentration of flights? Lisa, I may, may turn to you for that, please. Sure, um, Michael. The visual impacts uh, of the proposed action and alternatives um, should be discussed in the in in detail under um, um, under appropriate impact categories in the environmental assessment in that draft document. Um, usually, you find that discussions or those discussions in chapters two, four, eight. Oh, and probably chapter five as well and chapter 14. So it's all in that draft EA. And um, I would refer the commenter to our website um, uh, for reviewing that analysis because there's quite a bit of information there. Thanks, Michael. Okay, thank you, Lisa. And if I may have missed it, but metroplexenvironmental.com, I believe is where where they can go for those documents. Thank you, Michael, that's exactly right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we have another question. Has the FAA made a final decision to implement the project? I will, I'll start that one out. Uh, on May 11th, we issued the draft environmental assessment of proposed new routes and that, that kicked off a 60 day extended public comment period that runs until July 10th. But what happens after that is we'll consider and review all of the comments, analyze the comments that come in during the comment period. Those should be focused on the project as it's outlined in the draft environmental assessment. That's our proposed action, everything that we're talking about tonight but no final decision will be made until the FAA has an opportunity to consider those. And we hope to issue a final de environmental determination for the project in around September 30th. Um, and then in terms of new imp of implementation of new procedures, that would be more likely to occur probably in the spring summer timeframe of 2021. So until a final environmental determination is made, I would say the answer to that is no, we haven't made that final decision, but that's what that time frame looks like and the process between now through the comment period, analyzing those and then making that determination. All right, we have another question. Does this mean more concentration of airplane traffic? I live near Northdale Golf Course, north of Tampa. I may ask for some help from air traffic control there in Tampa. Chris, you want that? Yeah, yeah. Um, as far as on a north flow departure wise, it, there's not gonna be much change. They'll still be climbing it quickly above 
or as quickly as we can get them going uh, both. Um, I would assume that's more for when we're on a south flow and arriving um, into Tampa. And again, that would just be no more airplanes, just that they're more in a concentrated space. If we had the, uh, like one of the south arrival boards up, um, the, the change would be you're still, they're still feeding in in one spot, but then we're, for sequencing purposes, they get vectored or broken off uh, um, to get in line with each other. Okay, Chris, thanks. So when it, when it talks about more concentration of airplane traffic, it, it's possible you can see that along the satellite, uh, you know, the new satellite procedures. Uh, it doesn't mean more aircraft are flying, and I, I think that's what you were touching on, but it can be flying in a more concentrated area. Uh, Lisa, I'll ask you to confirm, but the, the noise analysis uh, considered that concentration and, and still found no significant or reportable increases in noise. That is correct, Michael. That okay. is very important to note. Thank you. All right. But it doesn't mean that people can't look and see maybe that a plane's flying in a slightly different location. So uh, that, that can happen with the concentration of routes. All right, thanks. Anybody else on that one? We'll, we'll keep moving. Uh, here, here's another one. What is DNL? What is DB? Uh, that was in the, the video and I'd like more of an explanation. So Lisa, you, you know I'm coming to you on that. <laughs> I do, I do. Okay, let me see if I can um, help explain it. Um, DNL, um, DNL is our day, night, average sound level. Um, DNL is the noise metric uh, that that we use to. Um, it's like a, a mechanism that we use to describe the effects of environmental noise in a simple and uniform way. DNL is a standard noise metric um, that we use for all our FAA studies for aviation noise exposure in um, airport communities. Now, DB is really, it, it's, uh, we abbreviate DB, but it's a unit of measurement, decibel. And um, it's the unit of measurement that we use uh, to uh, measure the intensity of sound. That's what dB means. And if we can get someone to pull up, um, I have a, a board, board, um, I think it's environmental board 13, the comparative noise chart. This, um, this chart can give you a good comparison um, how you can compare noise levels, indoor, common indoor sounds and noise levels to common outdoor noise levels. So you can kind of put things into you know, a little perspective. Um, if you think about a uh, common outdoor sound of a B74, um, a B747-400 at takeoff, and you can comp that generally compared to if you're indoor at a rock band concert, um, and you can see the noise levels associated with that. Um, another common common outdoor sound is a lawnmower when you're at three feet away, or a diesel truck at about 150 feet away. Um, that can kind of be compared to a food processor or a blender, or someone shouting at about three feet. Um, moving on down the scale, um, this, this graphic also shows kind of a, a common outdoor sound, as you know, of a, a, a B747-800 at takeoff, if you're about two miles away from it. And um, it can be compared to an indoor sound of a vacuum um, when you're 10 feet away. So this gives you a good little um, comparison and, and if you go to that website, it's listed at the bottom of that, of that, um, of that slide. It's FA.gov um, and follow the link there. And there's a nice little um, explanation to help understand the um, DNL and DB and all of the 
the techie kind of terms that we generally use. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lisa. All right, bear with me here for a second. Let me move to the next question. Will the noise tool be available long-term for people to see DNLs at different locations or is it only available for this project? Um, I have a couple thoughts on that. I don't know, Lisa or Jim, if you wanna add, but what, what I'm thinking is the analysis that we're showing in the noise tool compares specific analysis that was performed for the as part of the environmental assessment for this project. And it showed the forecast levels uh, between a no action alternative and the proposed action in 2021, which is the first year that we might see new procedures and also 2026. So the analysis that we've been sharing is pretty specific to this project. Uh, Jim, I, I see I'll you let, there. Uh, so I'll let Lisa I was about to breath for a second there. That's fine. I was just going to jump in there and say, I think it's more um, that noise tool is specific to this Metroplex project. And um, I'm not sure if it would be any good for any other project. Well, it wouldn't be any good for any other project or any other area. So it's available for use for this proposed action. And Jim, if you have something else to add. No, that, that's absolutely right. It, it displays the modeled um, noise for this particular project itself and only within that particular study area. So you couldn't say, hey, let's, can I use that tool someplace else? It, that's just, uh, doesn't work that way. It's available for this project right. only. So you're absolutely correct. So there is information available across Central and South Florida and it does show kind of what we're thinking in 2021 and 2026. Normally we leave content up for a period of time. I don't think we'll, so in any event, that, that site will be active and until it's not. That's not a very de defined answer. But Jim, do you think that we leave, we typically leave the archive of Metroplex information up for a, a while, don't we? This will be up for a while. And you know, there's a little bit more complex version of it on the metroplexenvironmental.com, but that would require you to you know download a, a number of files and to use uh, Google Earth. That will be up, I know, certainly long term. But you know, if this site with this uh, you know tool that we've developed for the uh, the workshops is going to be easier to use for the uh, the near term, certainly. Okay. Okay, we'll continue, thanks. We have another question. Why can't planes climb faster to higher altitudes quickly and reduce noise impacts on the ground? Well, I may, Dan, looks like or Dan and Gary bo both came unmuted, so. Uh, yeah, absolutely yeah. can, it's just a matter of, well, everything needs to be done with safety. So I'll, I'll just say there's a little asterisk there. We, you need to first consider terrain. Is there any uh, elevated terrain? In Florida, there's not, but sometimes that's an issue. Uh, the aircraft capability and at its heaviest, and if there's an emergency, and then sometimes there's weather. And then finally, I guess the most important thing is where is this uh, area that you're trying to uh, keep as quiet as possible? And would it be better to go to the side or to go up faster? So it just depends on each situation. You have to evaluate that where the where the area that you're trying to avoid is, and and make some judgments based on that. So, Michael, from our standpoint, pilots are always trying to get the airplane to the cruise altitude as fast as they possibly can. We're not flying lower at lower power settings to climb slower. We never do that. But through the sequence of takeoff, putting the landing gear up, putting our flaps up. Acceler accelerating the airplane through that whole process, that takes a little bit of time to get the airplane up to a safe maneuvering speed. But when we get it to that safe maneuvering speed, we're climbing as fast as we can to get it to the cruise high altitude so we can go faster at a more efficient pace. And that's always the goal. We're, we're constantly climbing at the same rate. All right, Dan, Gary, thank you. I may chime in, of course, different aircraft have different performance characteristics. Uh, weather has an impact or temperature, if you think of temperature. It's a lot better climb performance in cold weather than on a hot day. 
and then there can be procedures. I don't know from an air traffic perspective if any of our controllers want to help help with that, but there can be uh, interaction with other airports in the area where another procedure. Chuck, anything you want to yeah. add there? Yeah, I was going to add to that. that you made a good point there, uh, Michael. Um, the uh, Tampa area, uh, there's so many airports around the Tampa area, St. Petersburg, uh, MacDill, Albert Witted, uh, a lot of airports, a lot of airplanes. So sometimes we have to keep aircraft to, to park slow, uh, low and uh, let other airplanes go over the top of them. Um, and so that's how we have to keep them separated. They have to be a thousand feet apart. And uh, sometimes we can't climb those aircraft right away. It may not be the capability of the aircraft or anything else. It may just be because of traffic reasons why we keep mm -hmm. those aircraft low. So, Jim, I'm actually going to tap you with one last final thought, but I, I'm thinking as you deconflict procedures, you potentially eliminate some of those uh, some of those conflict points, wouldn't, wouldn't you think? <laughs> Are you, you're on mute. I muted, I muted myself. I knew I was going to do it. But uh, no, absolutely. We, you know, and it's not just for this, uh, you know, for the local area. Certainly, you know, it's it's not a competition, but aircraft landing and departing aircraft are competing for the same airspace. So that's one of the key things about the project is to, you know, provide through that accuracy and repeatability um, of the procedures um, with the increased ability to separate those different flows from one another or be, or be more assured that those flows are. Um, adequately separated. Right, it reminds me of, of being out on the road and seeing the lane is clear ahead of you, so. <laughs> All right, very good, we'll keep moving. Uh, I'll make a reminder for uh, viewers, we're seeing a lot of people participating on Zoom and social media. I wanna encourage you to keep the questions coming. You can text a question to 949-478-0253 we're gonna continue taking questions until eight o'clock. So again, that's 949-478-0253. And I'll, I'll move right into another question. I've noticed the planes have moved and are now much noisier in my area. When did you change the flight paths? Um, okay, I, I don't have the specifics on that. What I can tell you is that what we're talking about tonight in the C South Central Florida Metroplex is proposed and the earliest implementation date that we would see for changing these procedures is in the uh, spring and summer of 2021. Um, so that would be if things move according to schedule. Um, or hey, I Michael, guess. maybe, uh, you know, Jeff or one of the uh, air traffic guys can give us a little bit of insight into, you know, what they deal with certainly in hurricane season. You know, they've got weather blowing through there. there are, probably some reasons why aircraft might appear to be in a different place. Yeah, I'll go ahead and take that one. Thanks. Uh, that's exactly right. A lot of times it's due to weather. You know, we have those thunderstorms happening. It's been uh, starting to pick up here um, for us weather-wise, even though the volume is down, you know, because of uh, everything else going on. But the uh, weather has started back up. So we do have to move airplanes around the weather. They don't want to fly through it. It's not safe. And uh, we, we, either guide them around it or uh, let them uh, go around it themselves because they can see, you know, out their window better than we can see on the radar. So um, that's, that's a good possibility why you may see airplanes like that. Okay. Jeff, thanks for that. And then at different seasons of the year, obviously when the winds change, air, airplanes take off and land into the wind. I know there was some of that material that was available within uh, some of the, the preview workshop material. Um, so as the prevailing wind direction changes, you might find yourself under a departure stream versus an arrival stream, vice versa. So that can change seasonally as well, or, or not even just seasonally, but, but through the day it can change, turn an airport around. Okay, so no changes have been made on this project. That's not what you're seeing, I can tell you that. We have another question. How did the draft environmental assessment determine aircraft noise? And can you can we show that noise tool again? Lisa, I'm gonna come, come back to you on that. And okay, I'll ask no our, problem. our team if we can pull the tool up again. Sure, um, the draft EA modeled aircraft noise exposure for the proposed 
new procedure and the no action alternative under 2021 and 2026 forecasted conditions. And it, it considered the direct, indirect and cumulative effects of noise. Um, the FAA's environmental um, assessment measured aircraft noise using an, um, an annual day-night average sound level, and that's a DNL metric. Um, the significant noise is defined as day-night average sound level of 65 decibels or higher. The DNL metric is a single value representing um, aircraft sound level over a 24-hour period, and it also includes all the night, uh, all the aircraft sound generated within that period. Um, DNL is um, uh, the DNL metric includes a 10 decibel weighting for events between for noise events between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. and this weighting helps to account for a greater annoyance of uh, nighttime noise events caused by aviation and the metric essentially uh, that um, weighting essentially equals one nighttime flight to 10 daytime flights. Um, again, if you go to Florida Metroplex, uh, Florida Metroplex workshops.com, you can click on the noise tool that is there. I think you might see it on your screen right there. It's um, the noise tool button will bring you to this page. It has a little description about um, what we modeled during um, our analysis. And it also has um, a little description about what the significance threshold is and what reportable threshold is. Um, once you're there, if you want to search uh, for your specific address, uh, be it your school or your church or your residence or your or anything, you can type that in the search bar in the top left-hand corner of that tool, of that map. Um, you can start typing an address, and uh, we can arbitrarily pick an address so I can demonstrate what it does. Um, if I can have, uh, there we go, start typing an address, and similar addresses pop up. You just choose the one you're concerned with, and it will zoom in to a map pin. And once you see that map pin, um, the, blue, the darker blue circles around um, that area. Yes, the dark blue uh, grid, those are grid points and they're US Census, uh, US Census population points. And they're located at half, one half nautical mile across the entire study area. So you should find a few around the area that you are concerned about. You can click on w one of them and you will be able to see the noise results that um, came out of our noise modeling. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Lisa. All right, we have another question. Is the overall objective of the Metroplex to make the arrival and departure procedures more precise? If so, doesn't this result in the concentration of aircraft overflights for communities under the flight paths? Jim, I see you I'd, unmuted. I'd be happy. Oh. Yes, okay. sir, I'd be happy to, uh, to take that one. And that, that is a really good question. We do hear that, um, you know, with all of the projects and, you know, all of the procedures that we, we develop. To a degree, that's true because of the, the accuracy and the repeatability of it. it. Although we're not introducing any more aircraft into the system, you know, people could notice that uh, aircraft are less dispersed. So that does not mean that there won't be um, radar vectoring still, or there won't be impacts from weather, but there could in fact be a noticeable, le le noticeably less dispersion or a concentration of aircraft in some areas. And I really want to emphasize the second part of this, that for this project in the Tampa area, we worked very closely with the airports to, you know, 
ensure that we understood their concerns about the local communities and we you know, specifically emphasized changes primarily above 10,000 feet. I think we talked about with the exception of the, the one uh, NOS departure that there should be very minimal changes. And as you looked at the boards and you look at the, the different flight tracks that are there, um, we keep saying, well, well you're, you're gonna see tomorrow what you see today. For the most part, that's very true in this case. Um, but there were some other reasons that we uh, associated with this project. For instance, the, that higher altitude structure where we're trying to improve the, you know, the predictability and the, 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 our knowledge of the trajectory of aircraft as they fly within the national airspace system. I think, Michael, you talked about those on and the off ramps that we're creating there. So we are joining that, that higher altitude structure within the national airspace system where we have made some adjustments at, at higher altitudes to uh, increase the efficiency and you know provide for more direct flight so that's a that's a, a really great question I, I think the people in the tampa and uh, sarasota area will be uh, very pleased with how they've been represented by the airports and you know their airport authority here okay jim thank you okay Questions keep coming. Will I see more aircraft where I live south of St. Pete and Pinellas Park? And we can, we can pull a, a, a board up for that. I'll, I'll come to uh, Jeff, I think. Jeff, if you'll take that. Sure, I got this one. Uh, either St. Pete South Flow or North Flow, uh, either one will be, be fine. Um, I can't speak to the amount of aircraft that will be flying in that area. Uh, that's that's not really up to us. I can say that procedures are not uh, designed to bring more aircraft to any specific area. So whatever is there today is, is what's going to be uh, when this goes into effect. Nothing uh, new as far as Metroplex is concerned. Uh, like I said, the amount of aircraft, possibly more, possibly less. We don't know that. But, um, yeah, that's what I got for you. Okay, Jeff. So no, I think maybe more significant, most significant, I think what I heard you say is the, the project isn't gonna change that. There can be other factors in the system in terms of volume or even some of the things I mentioned earlier with weather or shorter term things that can affect where planes are flying, but this project shouldn't be affecting what they're seeing south of St. Pete. Is that consistent, Jeff? Yes, that's consistent. Okay, all right, very good, thanks. All right, what are the airports and airlines doing as part of this project? All right, so I'll, I'll add, I'll, I'll share some. One of the things I said up front is that this is an FAA initiative and I, I wanna be really clear on that. It's part of our role to help manage the safe and efficient movement of aircraft through the national airspace system. But at the same time, we work with our, our industry partners, both air carriers and the airports to understand the needs of the system, to understand where there may be inefficiencies of the system. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there and I'll see if any if anybody wants to add. I see Gary, it looks like you're off mute. Yeah, we'd be, we'd be happy to help because we do help and collaborate with the FA on many of these projects and it's technical in nature. You know, we, we are uh, under the guise of working with the FAA and, and uh, we can offer technical expertise on how the aircraft fly, the pilot behavior, how we interact with air traffic control and possible problems that we can see from how the automation in the airplane might negatively interact or positively be interact with the procedures. So it's technical in nature that we are involved to uh, offer advice to the, the FAA. All right, thanks, Gary. And, and I'll say we work, um, you know, airports routinely provide information to us about, you know, we have conversations about, for example, noise abatement procedures, which we're not changing in this project. We also are aware of noise sensitive areas. And so we do, we hold community outreach and often much like the panel that you see tonight, when we did workshops in Tampa and St. Pete last year, four workshops with this project, 
I think we all have our ears open to listen to where those concerns are. And, and those continue to be conversations that impact the designs. And that's part of why we're looking for uh, feedback from, from the public, public comments, the active public comment period that's open right now through July 10th. Any, any other comments from anybody on our, uh, any other participants? And Mike, I'll jump in on that because I was at quite a few of the meetings working with the airlines. And as we were drawing up and designing these procedures, we had to double check with and make sure that they were flyable and it wasn't a workload <clears throat> or too much on the pilots and um, a lot went in with the collaboration between both uh, working with the pilots and air traffic on to design and make these all work. All right, Chris, thanks. I would uh, add to it, uh, different airplanes operate differently. So one airline's airplanes mm -hmm. may do really well and some others may calculate that certain descent or climb differently and interact a different way. So. It's got to be tested with the both, or I should say both. There's two main types of airplanes, but companies, but uh, they have to make sure they work with those computers. And then the the uh, com companies that make the software that do the uh, charts are also back programmed with the new um, procedures once they're all implemented. And then uh, even if it's all that's done, you, know, you go along and you start flying, you find out, oops, this is not working so well. We got to uh, tweak this or that. So it's an ongoing process. Okay, Dan, thank you. I Pre appreciate you both sharing that, those perspectives. All right, the, the video, one of our videos said this is all of South Florida. So how many procedures are being updated? Um, let's, I, can, I can tell you it's 21 airports. Uh, Jim, I don't know if you wanna jump in. 21 airports are the, define the study area and, and they're through Central and South Florida. Think about going from Tampa, St. Pete all the way down to Miami and, and all those airports in between. The four major international airports are, are Tampa, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami, but there, there are 21 airports in total in our study area. Correct. You know, and Michael, we've got about 106 new procedures. That includes uh, you know 70 area navigation procedures. We did have to retain some of those older procedures, which we, uh, we modified. And there are uh, also 19 existing conventional procedures and four existing area navigation procedures uh, in the project. So um, a, fairly, a fairly large project of all of the uh, Metroplex projects. This will uh, be the certainly the largest in land area. And you know, with the number of airports uh, is a, and the, the airspace, the amount of airspace that's involved is um, pretty complex. Uh, very much so. Thanks, Jim. Okay, we have another question. Will the overall lateral or vertical boundaries of F-11, that's one of our FAA facilities, Tampa, Fort Myers, Palm Beach, or Miami Tracons change? That's a, that's a detailed question. I'm gonna have to come to air traffic for that. Jeff? Uh, I can speak for Tampa. Tampa's not. Um, there may be other airports that are, but we, we are not. Okay, do we have any of our other participants who have that, Jim? So, my, yeah, Michael, I'd uh, be happy to weigh in. Frequently, we do have to make some adjustments in airspace boundaries to accommodate uh, new procedures. And I'm pretty certain in this, this project that we do have a couple of areas where we've uh, made adjustments in uh, airspace between uh, facilities to accommodate procedures. All right, thank you both. I'm kind of balancing the clock and the questions. I'm going to keep us moving because I know there, there's still some queued up here. Um, at what distance does uh, what at what distance do FAA air traffic controllers and pilots make the decision to change or alter routes for weather? I'm assuming that means severe weather when we're when we're maybe altering a route, maybe closing a, a route or or deviating for weather. So I'm looking to see Gary, do, do you want to provide a perspective from the airline? 
Sure, I can take it up from the pilot side. We're, we're constantly looking at what we have in route. It can be thunderstorms, it can be turbulence, it can be icing, it can be any number of things that we're considering what we have in front of us. We develop plans, we aren't gonna fly through thunderstorms and there's a lot of other things like turbulence that we will not fly through either. So what we do is we build a, a level of communication between us and ATC and us and other pilots talking on the radio so that everybody will know what we're seeing on our radar. And we have really good tools in the airplane through radar and some other features that we can see all this weather, but then we have to tell ATC what we're seeing and develop a plan. That's when uh, we hand it off to them and tell them what we'd like to do. And they tell us what we can do. And this is a good point to hand it off to them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks Gary. Uh, Chuck, do you have something to add? Yeah, I'll take I'll take that. Uh, the uh, FAA uh, Command Center in Virginia uh, looks out at the national, the entire national airspace system, and they see uh, areas in the country that need to have root structures uh, changes due to weather and volume, and so they they uh, work along with the facility, the route facilities, uh, the traffic management units to uh, move airplanes around uh, weather. Uh, as you get closer to an airport, there's some weather that builds up around the airport, and then uh, uh, obviously uh, an aircraft will want to deviate or a pilot want to deviate around um, some areas of weather within the terminal area. Uh, generally, when they do that, the, uh, the the deviations are a lot lot smaller and a lot less than they are in the uh, phase. So uh, that question is um, it's a tough question to answer because there's so many dynamics out there. Uh, they could be deviating around the weather for hundreds of miles away, mm -hmm. or as they get closer and the weather builds up, they could be uh, deviating up to, you know, just a couple miles away from the weather. So it's a good question. And it's a hard question to answer. Right. I, I appreciate what you shared there at the end, Chuck, because I don't know that it's, it's a specific distance. And I think that's what you were getting at. It can be weather at the destination that ultimately ripples back. It can be weather that's along your procedure that closes off a particular route. And that, that might be near an airport or it might be 50 miles away. So we can actually have changes due to weather, even though the sky can be blue right at the airport. And it depends which where the direction the winds are coming from. If you're downwind from it, you want to create a really wide berth because the effect's going to be felt quite a ways downwind. If you're upwind from it, you can go right up almost next to it and not feel a burble at all. And uh, that's the uh, en route in the, in the more terminal area near the airport, uh, it's kind of neat because you get a little back and forth with the controllers as you say, I need to go this far. And the airplane ahead of you or behind you says, well, we need to go this far. The controller starts to see a pattern and gets an idea where the weather really is because the radar, it looks different when you look at it. Just look on your apps. If you've got a radar, uh, fly my radar pro or weather bug and you look at the radars, they're different pictures. Even though they're the same radar, they've, they've conditioned them differently. And so that's what happens with ATC. They see a weather in one place, but the pilots are going around a little bit further away and you get the idea that, ah, that's where the weather really is. That's where we need to go. And it's a collaborative effort and it really works well. Right. Yeah, great point. A lot of discussions about weather and we deal with it every day. Uh, that's, that's part of the system. All right, thanks everybody. Next question I see, when when are airports going to see more airplanes like before COVID happened? All right, um, so we may, we may get some feedback from different participants. Uh, our role at the FAA is to, you've heard me maybe say it a, a few times, but our mission is about the safe and efficient movement of aircraft through the system. So we essentially take what's in the system and we get it from point A to point B, uh, providing air traffic control capabilities and, and do that safely. Obviously, that is a collaborative effort, much like we talked about on the last question. Um, I don't know if there's any, any industry thought on that. I, I know that there's some data points that are out there. For example, some of, there were some reports last month that there were more bookings than cancellations, for example, in the last month, but you know, it, it's a, we anticipate that the traffic will be returning. I don't know that we have a specific in terms of the time frame. Uh, Gary, Jim, looks like, well, let's go to Gary first and then Jim, if you want. Okay. Mike, Mike, that you're exactly right. And uh, we're a little bit unsure what 
the future holds, but we are hoping that traffic comes back up to the level that it was a few months ago within a year to 18 months. The traffic is increasing. Uh, we can actually say that it's, it's doubled uh, because we had such a low, low load factor for a substantial amount of time, it was worrisome. But the, the passengers are coming back in, uh, we hope within 18, year to 18 months, the flights are back too. Great, thanks Gary. Jim? Right. Michael, probably a, a little known statistic uh, out in the public is that, I mean, normally, uh, you know, Atlanta and uh, Chicago are fighting to be the busiest airport in the system. Well, during this, this event, Anchorage, Alaska has been the busiest airport in the uh, national airspace system. And that's primarily because the, the airlines have had to focus their operation on the cargo operation. And th there's a lot of cargo that goes through Anchorage, Alaska. So when we see uh, Anchorage you know, fall off the top of the uh, pedestal for the busiest airport, we know that the uh, traffic is coming, coming back up. One thing our company we've talked about is um, it's not just getting people to feel comfortable walking into the airport, which is a partnership with the airports, but uh, on the airplane, and they talk talk about a tunnel, like curb to curb tunnel from the, when you get dropped off, you get picked up, you know, making it as safe as possible. But one big factor too has been is, you know, it's one thing uh, to go to Orlando, for example, but if none of the theme parks are open, um, there's things to do, but just not the big draws that were there before. So until those features open, like in Vegas, the strip, once that opens, you can get people comfortable, but if they don't have any reason to travel, they're not going to go. So we're seeing that come back and the theme parks are opening mm -hmm. up this week, I think, and then the early next month. So we'll see a pick up, uh, pick up then as well. All right, great. Thanks everyone for tag teaming on that one. Uh, and I think, we have, I think we have time for one more question. How, how do you determine when the star should or shouldn't connect to the common instrument procedure fixes? Uh, it says Tampa stars seem to all terminate on downwind, unlike some of the Miami procedures. Right, and um, you know, I'd like, Michael, I'd like to tag team that with Gary because we've worked many, many of these um, issues at airports. Okay. You know, one of the, the key purposes of that arrival procedure and that approach procedure is to ensure that we establish an airplane on a stabilized descent, uh, you know, to the runway. So our, if the procedures are available, we absolutely want to connect the arrival procedure, you know, with an approach procedure to the airport. Um, frequently that's not available or the operation doesn't lend itself to that. We may not have the approach procedure uh, to support it. So we have a tendency to uh, go with a little bit more radar vectoring. And, you know, Gary McMullen, if you wouldn't mind weighing in here, he's, Gary is really one of the experts in this, uh, you know, in the national airspace system. Gary, could you comment, please? I sure can, Jim. What we always try to do is build the best tool for the scenario that we're in. And there are many times that we do tie the star to the approach. It's done very, very scientifically. In other words, we tie it with the right altitudes and speeds to allow the aircraft to make every attempt to stay at idle throughout the, the star and throughout most of the approach. That, that's done with the FA criteria that we've all worked on very hard to make that uh, a, a fact today. But when we can do that, we do. And uh, there's just some times that that possibility doesn't exist. So that, that's uh, a few of the places that we worked on in Florida. All right, great. Gary, Jim, thank you. All right, I think that brings us to the end of the workshop. So I wanna thank everybody for participating, for asking good questions, sending those in to us. I hope our answers were informative. You know, I wanna thank our subject matter experts, our specialists for providing their expertise, our entire FAA communications team, along with everyone else who supported this workshop in the background. I wanna acknowledge the industry representatives who joined us this evening to contribute your perspectives to the discussion, so thank you. As a reminder, your questions today are not part of the legal record for the draft environmental assessment. To comment for the record, please go to the comments tab on this website, floridametroplexworkshops.com.
You can also email us or send us a written comment, and those addresses are also available on the comments tab on this website. I want to remind everybody the comment period is open until July 10th of 2020, and after the comment period closes, the FAA will consider and review all the substantive comments received during the comment period. The FAA expects to issue an environmental determination in September 2020. I also want to remind everybody tonight's workshop is recorded and will be available tomorrow, but we're hosting another virtual workshop for Tampa St. Pete tomorrow, June 5th at noon. That concludes our workshop for today, for tonight. Thank you for joining us.